Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 97, I believe it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for about the next no, almost half hour, I'm gonna be ranting away at you about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, comments, questions, whatever, send them to me directly. My email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And since I'm sure you didn't catch that, uh, if you want to uh, send me email, check out my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, which will be up around here somewhere a couple times during the show. And uh, you can get the email address from there. I do answer my email, sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer. But if you send me email, please remember to include something like left side of the aisle or your, or your cable show or something like that in the subject line. Okay, so, all right, with that out of the way. Um, I always like to start with some good news where I can, and these days it always seems that the good news always comes from the same topic. Uh, Friday, February 22nd, the um, Obama administration formally filed with the Supreme Court a brief urging the justices to strike down the Defense of Marriage Act or the DOMA or DOMA as unconstitutional on the grounds that it violates, quoting, the fundamental guarantees of equal protection. Quoting the brief, the law denies to tens of thousands of same-sex couples who are legally married under state law an array of important federal benefits that are available to legally married opposite-sex couples. Because this discrimination cannot be justified as substantially furthering any important governmental interest, Section 3, which is the heart of this bill, is unconstitutional. Now, the DOMA defines marriage as between one man and one woman. It has been found unconstitutional in suits in lower courts. One of those suits is scheduled for uh, oral argument before the Supreme Court on March 27th. Now there is another case, a closely related case, which is going to be argued uh, before the court right about the same time. This is a suit brought to overturn California's infamous Proposition 8, or Prop 8 as it came to be called. Um, this stripped away a right to same-sex marriage, which such couples had previously obtained. Uh, that particular case about this has seen a rather surprising development recently. At least 75 top Republicans have signed an amicus, that is a friend of the court brief, uh, that is being submitted to the Supreme Court this week about this case, arguing that same-sex couples have a constitutional right to marriage. Now, with the exception of, of two current members of Congress, Representatives Richard Hanna and um, Hanna ross Leighton, most of the signers are former government officials, but even so, the list is, is fairly impressive. Among the signers are former Utah Governor John Huntsman, former Representative Deborah Price, former Massachusetts Governors William Weld and Jane Swift, former New Jersey Governor Christine Todd Whitman, Bush National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley, Carlos Gutierrez, a Commerce Secretary under Bush, uh, James Comey, a top Bush uh, Justice Department official, David Stockman, who was Ronald Reagan's first budget director, and former Republican National Committee Chair Ken Melman. The court is expected to hear arguments, uh, oral arguments, and, and reach a decision. It's supposed to reach its decision sometime early in the summer. All right, from there, moving on to something that I wanted to get to last time, but uh, didn't for lack of time, so uh, I wanted to do it early this time to make sure I got it in. On Sunday, February 17th, the largest climate protest ever in U.S. history occurred in Washington, D.C. Some 40,000 people from 30 states and some Canadian provinces turned out on a cold, blustery day to demand that, uh, that Barack Obama block the Keystone XL pipeline and act on his promises to do something about climate change. Four days before this, on February 13th, 48 environmental, civil rights, and human rights activists, including Julian Bond, Robert Kennedy Jr., uh, and Daryl Hannah, blocked a sidewalk in front of the White House in an act of civil disobedience to protest the pipeline. Now, a significant addition to that number, that 48, was a man named Michael Bruhn. He's executive director of the Sierra Club. The reason this is important is that this was the first time in its 120-year history that the Sierra Club had endorsed an act of civil disobedience. That's how important they think this is. Now, I've talked about the Keystone XL pipeline before. It's intended to carry tar sands from Alberta, Canada to refineries in Texas. 
There are two big problems with the plan. One, of course, is the danger of spills and leaks and, and the associated damage to local environments, including wildlife and water supplies. But that risk actually may be bigger than you think. Take a look at this picture, okay? Now, I know it's hard to see, but what I want you to notice is that thin light line going across the picture, right? Um, in early December, three activists blockaded themselves inside a segment of the uh, XL pipeline in Winona, Texas. When they woke up in the morning, they discovered sunlight coming through the lousy welding job that had been done on this section of pipe. That's what, this photo was taken from inside the pipe. That light is what you're seeing is outside light leaking in. All three protesters were arrested. They were held in prison for 24 days. Uh, but an hour after the arrest, TransCanada, this is the corporation that's trying to build this pipeline, TransCanada took that section of pipeline and buried it. Now, you know, this pipeline, it's supposed to be checked by independent inspectors, but apparently independent here has about the same meaning um, as does the requirement that super PACs don't coordinate with political candidates does there. In fact, TransCanada pipeline contractors are allowed to choose their own inspectors. But here is the other problem, the actual, the bigger problem here. Tar sands is about the dirtiest, most environmental fouling, air polluting, greenhouse gas generating, global warming pushing way to get oil there is. Bill McKibben is the founder of 350.org, uh, which is one of the groups uh, sponsoring the, uh, that big protest along with um, the Sierra Club and the Hip Hop Caucus. Uh, but Bill McKibben says development of tar sands would mean game over on climate change and referred to the pipeline as lighting a carbon match. The EPA actually estimates that this pipeline would boost U.S. carbon emissions by 27.6 million metric tons a year. That's the equivalent of putting 6 million additional cars on the road. And in fact, an, uh, an outfit called Oil Change International says that that's too low because that estimate doesn't take into effect all the, the, the effects of this. Uh, the group says that the pipeline and the associated boost to the tar sands industry would actually raise total emissions by at least 13%. Now that, by the way, only serves to emphasize that the rally, again, was not just about the pipeline. It was about the whole threat of climate change and the demand that the amazing Mr. O live up to his promises to do something about it. The fact is we cannot avoid the truth of climate change. We can't escape it except by willful self-delusion. The more time goes by, the higher, of mountain, the higher the mountain of evidence becomes. For example, this past November, the World Meteorological Organization, this is an agency of the United Nations, reported that the volume of greenhouse gases went up 30% in 2011, with the gases rate, uh, ranked as the most harmful, which are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, they all hit record levels of concentration. Now, 350.org, that group, uh, they get their name from the fact that atmospheric scientists say that 350 parts per million is the upper safe limit for concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere if we're to head off the worst effects of climate change. C carbon concentrations are now at 395 parts per million and rising. Uh, and, and Michael Giroux, who's the Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, noted that until now, about half of the carbon humans have emitted over the years have been taken up by carbon sinks, like trees and particularly the oceans. But there are clear signs that those sinks are reaching the limits of their ability to absorb carbon. Now, more recently, last month, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, issued its annual climate assessment, uh, which uh, noted that 2012 was the hottest year on record for the United States. Just days after that, the National Climate Assessment Development Advisory Committee published the draft of the, third, of the, uh, of the nation's third climate assessment report. This is intended to be a comprehensive review of all of the latest and best peer-reviewed science about the extent and effects of climate change on the United States.
For those of us who've been following the issue, this report didn't tell us anything we didn't know, but it still makes disturbing and even depressing reading. Uh, it says that evidence is stronger and clearer than ever that the climate is rapidly changing, in fact, more rapidly than had previously been predicted, and that the main driver is human activities, particularly the burning of fossil fuels. It also says that weather extremes are on the rise, and there is more and more evidence that there is actually a connection between these weather extremes and climate change. Now, scientists say that to keep the, uh, to, to prevent the worst uh, effects of climate change, we need to keep the rise in global temperature below 2 degrees Celsius, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The bad news is that right now we are on track to hit a 4 degrees Celsius increase by the end of the century. The good news is that uh, the latest research says that it is still possible to stay below that 2 degrees Celsius limit. Uh, the bad news is that uh, doing that would require world carbon emissions to peak in 2016 and then to decline 5% a year for the next 34 years. And let me be blunt, with current international negotiations on climate change, hoping to have a deal by 2015 which won't go into effect until 2020, I really doubt we're up for it. And this is one of the reasons why 40,000 people marched in Washington, the largest climate demonstration in U.S., perhaps world, history. And the major network newscasts, CBS, NBC, ABC, could barely be aroused enough to even mention that it occurred. Now, CNN actually did some live coverage of the march, but we still tend to forget that cable outfits are still swamped in numbers by these major network TV newscasts. And people cannot care about what they don't know about. All right, so from there, going on to one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. I had so many aspirants for the big red nose this week that I was having trouble choosing one. In fact, some of those are going to be held over to possibly be for next week. But then I came across this. The winners this week are Oklahoma State Senator Clark Jolie and self-declared women's health researcher Dr. Dominic Padula of Oklahoma City. Now, the state of Oklahoma already bars insurance companies from covering abortions, forcing women to buy an additional rider. But that's not enough for this pair. Jolie has introduced legislation saying, quote, No employer shall be required to provide or pay for any benefit or service related to abortion or contraception through the provision of health insurance to his or her employees. Now, first, the fact that making it harder for women to get contraception will increase the number of unwanted pregnancies and therefore the number of abortions seems to be totally lost on him, which would already qualify him for the award. But wait, there's more. Jolie said he introduced the measure at the result of a request from Padula, who says he is morally opposed to birth control and uh, complained about his difficulty of finding a cheap group insurance plan that did not cover it. In fact, Padula says that women are worse off with contraception because it suppresses and radically contradicts who they are. You see, part, this is quoting him, part of their identity is the potential to be a mother. So apparently women who have gone through menopause are no longer women, but uh, be that as it may, those women who aren't women anymore are apparently better off than women on contraception because they are, quote, poisoning their bodies, unquote, in their radically contradictory efforts to avoid being baby factories. Now, what actually makes this whole thing less amusing is that this bill actually passed the Senate Business and Commerce Committee of the Oklahoma Legislature on a 9-0 to zero vote with no debate. On the other hand, what makes this a little more amusing is that Jolie's bill opens with this phrase, notwithstanding any other provision of state or federal law. Article 6, uh, Article 6, Section 2 of the Constitution says that the Constitution and federal laws are the lo supreme laws of the land to which all states are bound. Apparently, the text of the Constitution is among the things that has not penetrated the hallowed halls of the Oklahoma legislature. 
we are going to take a break. Back we are, right here. Um, now, we're going to start right the second half of the show with uh, our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Uh, the Outrage of the Week this week is one that demonstrates, if demonstration was actually still needed, just how fragile and limited your freedom is when cops invoke the magic word, drugs. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution reads, quoting, The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Notice it refers to persons, houses, papers, and effects. It doesn't say anything about your car. Courts have long held that driving is a privilege, not a right. So the state can put any restrictions on it that it wants. And that you, by in the course of recognizing that having a driver's license is often a necessity in today's society, by getting the license, you are willingly agreeing to those restrictions. And police have then used that supposed willing acceptance to turn your car into what a lot of defense attorneys refer to as a Fourth Amendment free zone. The Supreme Court recently ruled in a case involving a drug sniffing dog. A Florida cop had stopped the same guy twice, walked his drug sniffing dog around the car twice. Um, both times the dogs alerted to the presence of drugs, giving the cop probable cause to search the truck, and in both cases, nothing was found. No drugs were found. The Florida Supreme Court ruled that both searches were illegal. In order to use a dog's alert to justify a search, the court said, police must demonstrate more than that the dog was trained and certified, but that it was reliable. This actually was in keeping with the U.S. Supreme Court's own standard, which was that cops have the right to search property uh, if, if, quote, a well-trained and reliable dog, unquote, indicates the presence of illegal drugs. But in considering the case, in this case, the Supreme Court unanimously, and I emphasize unanimously, ignored its own standard and reversed the Florida Supreme Court. They declared that courts should consider a dog sniff as reliable if the dog has passed a certified training program that includes a controlled performance tests. That this dog had a clear record of being unreliable in the field didn't matter because being able to, de to demonstrate reliability, quoting the court, defies common sense. I expect we would call this faith-based judicial reasoning. We must have faith in the dog. The point here is that to justify a search in the, content, in the context of a routine traffic stop, the police need probable cause to believe that the person stopped is committing a crime that justifies the search. Police dogs hitting on suspects like this guy now become a proxy for probable cause, which is an open invitation for police to search. And when you give police an open invitation like that, history says they're going to use it. And history also says, because remember, the dog in this case doesn't even have to be a reliable dog. If you give cops an open invitation to search, they will do it, and this will fall, history says, most heavily on the poor and communities of color. There is absolutely no reason to expect that that's going to change now. And what's more, there is an outrage underlying this outrage. This is what's called an external canine sniff. This has been held by the Supreme Court not to be a search. It's what they call a Fourth Amendment non-event. Now here's the question that I want answered. How is this not a search? The dog is a tool, a tool the cop is using to extend their capabilities, to detect things which they cannot see or smell or hear. The dog is a tool. Uh, what, what's the answer you get? Oh, no, no, no. The dog is not searching for smells. The dog is merely a passive receptor, quote unquote, of the smells that are there. Yeah, but the point is, it's not the dog that's the active party. It's the cop. The dog's not just wandering around the field or something. 
The cop is actively leading this dog on a lead to your car to sniff here, sniff there, sniff to see if they can find anything. You know, there are these new things out, they're being developed, they're, they're not uh, in practical form yet, but they're in development. They're called drug sniffers. They're like a wand that you can hold that is actually more sensitive and more discriminating than a dog's nose in detecting smells. If a cop had one of these wands and went around your car like this with the wand, seeing if it lit up for anything, is that a search? And if, if the dog is not a search, why is that a search? I, did, I mean, this is, this is a name. The whole purpose of a tool, of any tool, any tool down to a hammer or a, or a lever or whatever, the, the purpose of a tool is to enable you to do things you could not otherwise do. You know, cops have long been allowed to deal with things in plain sight or in plain hearing or in plain smell. This case, that doesn't exist. The cop is using a tool to extend their abilities beyond those of a human being. How is doing that not a search? If the court is going to follow, it's going to follow its own logic in this, the court is going to have to say that the only area where you have privacy, the only area where you, are, where you are free from these kind of searches are those areas where our latest, most advanced technology will not reach. And that notion that the logic of the court leads inescapably to that conclusion is an incredible outrage. Okay. I'm going to move on from there to our weekly discussion about guns, one outrage to another. Uh, this week our discussion of guns is going to be relatively short because uh, it's, one, it's going to be mo more, uh, uh, mostly about more pushback against the, the gun nuts. However, before we do that, let's take a moment to remind ourselves just how wacko these people really are. There is, of course, Swain La Pepe Le Pew, the CEO of the Nutsoid Rabbit Brains of America, who recently claimed that limiting access to semi-automatic weapons limits a people's ability to survive. Because if someone is invading your house, you, you can't expect to have to be limited to only six shots. You're going to need 10 or 50 or 100, whatever. This, by the way, was right around the same time that Le Pepe Le Pew also said that he didn't care what anybody said. He knew that the purpose of background checks is for some kind of nefarious government plot against gun owners. And besides, checks are ineffective because of the opposition of the incredibly powerful mental health lobby. Then there is this blogger, I love this one, this blogger who said, mass oh, this is quoting, mass shootings always get lots of press coverage, but what about mass shootings that are thwarted when a bystander pulls his or her gun and ends it? He then went on to cite a case where an off-duty cop shot a would-be mass shooter before he was able to shoot more than one person. Now, sure, this twit said it was an off-duty cop, but it could have been anybody. Yeah, sure, and the cop did use a gun, but he could have just as easily been a slingshot or a pie. All right, then we've got uh, Charlotte Allen. She wrote at National Review and to complain that the Newtown massacre happened because it was a, quote, feminized setting, unquote, without enough testosterone-fueled aggression around. And she wondered what might have happened if, quoting, some of the huskier 12-year-old boys had converged on the shooter. Columnist Megan McArdle didn't wonder. She wrote at the Daily Beast that children should have it drilled into them that, quoting, the correct thing to do is for everyone to instantly run at the guy with the gun. We've got Representative Steve Stockman of Texas who wondered aloud if the victims of gun violence, which Obama invited to his State of the Union address, were useful idiots. But my personal favorite comes from Senator Lamar Alexander, who said on MSNBC on January 30th that, quoting, I think video games is a bigger problem than guns uh, because video games affects people, unlike, apparently, getting shot. 
Now, this is the way these people think, but the fact is there is pushback and there is a change in attitudes. California, for example, already has among the toughest gun laws in the country. But according to a new statewide poll, by overwhelming margins of like from 61 to 83 percent, residents of California favor making those laws even tougher. In Maryland, 85% support a proposal by the governor to require gun buyers to submit to fingerprinting, safety training, and have background checks and safety training. 63% uh, support tougher gun control laws overall. Nationwide, 54% support tougher gun controls overall, 44% of them strongly. Also, an illegal victory, one too rare these days, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver has ruled that permits allowing people to carry concealed guns do not uh, come under the Second Amendment. Quoting, in light of our nation's extensive practice of restricting citizens' freedom to carry firearms in a concealed manner, we hold that this activity does not fall within the scope of Second Amendment protections. Now, in this case, there are legal technicalities involving reciprocal recognition between states of permits, but none of that changes this. Finally on this, I mentioned um, last week, I mentioned the, um, uh, the primaries in Chicago to replace former Representative Jesse Jackson Jr. The winner of the Democratic primary, and therefore very likely of the general election, is former state representative Robin Kelly, the woman who touted her F rating with the NRA in her campaign. She got 53% of the vote in what was essentially a three-way race. And by the way, one last quick thing, a brand new study by the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence tells you what you already knew. States with the most restrictive gun laws have lower rates of gun-related deaths, and those with the weakest gun laws have the highest. Uh, and by the way, when that study was released last month, the San Francisco Chronicle sent it to four different pro-gun groups for comment and reaction. Not one responded. All right, last thing for today. I got about two minutes, I think, so I should have time to get this in. I haven't talked about the economy much of late. Uh, I promise I'm going to get back to it next week. But I did want to mention something important right now. You've been hearing about the sequester probably until your ears ache. The idea was that this was a, there was to be a deadline after which these rapid deep cuts in domestic and military spending would come into effect. Uh, these cuts were something that neither party would want to see happen so that they would be forced to reach some other way to deal with the, the incredible deficit monster. All right, that's, that's the deal. Now, apparently it hasn't worked so well. But here's the thing. This longer term, these longer term proposals to deal with the deficit all also involve massive cuts in domestic spending. In fact, even deeper cuts than the sequester. And they really don't even touch defense spending. Plus some small tax increases, not even really relevant. In other words, what they're arguing, what they're arguing is over different ways to screw you different ways to cut government services, different ways to cut health services, environmental protection, food stamps, housing assistance, roads, rails, and bridges, um, uh, the arts, local aid to firefighters, uh, uh, teachers, uh, cops, uh, sanitation workers, support for libraries. It's all these, uh, most of these programs involve proposals to cuts in Social Security and Medicare, cuts in Medicaid. I mean, all of this, all of this, all of this, what they're arguing about what they're arguing about is a different way to cut what government provides. A different way to give you less. A different way to take things away from you. A different way to leave you more and more on your own. In other words, to put it bluntly, what they are trying to decide is which way to screw you. Fast and hard or slow and long. That is what they are arguing over. And don't you ever forget it. Okay, that's it. I'm going to wrap up there. Uh, we're going to be out of here. I'm going to see you again next week. Uh, coming up to our 100th show, maybe we'll do something special for that. That would be kind of nice. In the meantime, keep watching Public Access TV, folks. It's your place. You use it. All right? See you next week.